So perhaps I'd, I'd like to invite Alan, who hasn't actually um, participated yet in this uh, day, to, to say something. Perhaps you should, as we've always said, introduce yourself. I've already introduced your role in the project. Perhaps you'd like to say something about your background. Uh, okay, my, I'm Alan Marsden from Lancaster University. And uh, background, I was originally trained as uh, a music analyst. Uh, but my first job actually was in writing computer programs. And so I, I, like many of us involved in this project, have had a foot in both or several camps. Um, what I want to, what I'm, Tim's right, there are certain things which I thought I might say uh, to kick this off. And so I'm not going to say all of them, but I'm going to skip to the thing that I would have said near the end, which is to answer the sort of what next question. What do I think? might be the, not, not necessarily the outcomes of the Transforming Musical Project, but the challenges or things, that, the visions that it proposes for future work. And uh, challenges, I think, they are in the main. Um, the first is actually something which we haven't talked about very much, but it's under, been underlying quite a lot of the presentations there, which is about method, research method. Um, there's a couple of times people have talked about how to get musicologists or to encourage musicologists to make more use of digital tools and often there's an implication that actually tools have got to be made more user friendly and so it's somehow it's a fault of the developers of the computer software that it's actually just too complicated and so this is uh, why musicologists are not using it. I think that's actually part, only very partly true. Uh, in fact a lot of the tools are not that complicated, not that difficult to use. But the musicologist has got to do something different as well to make use of these tools because there's a different kind of, different kinds of things become possible and so uh, uh, different kinds of things have to be done in the research method. Crucially, in any piece of research we have to know how to judge the reliability of our conclusions. And how you do that in the digital domain, I think, is actually quite different from how you would do it in traditional musicology. Uh, particularly, the challenge here comes from having to deal with very large quantities of data, uh, which I think will happen more and more in the future, because that's actually one of the crucial things that digital technology makes available for us, is what makes possible, is looking at much more data than has been typical for musicologists in the past. And so I'm uh, in, in the area of uh, studies and literature, there's quite a lot of talk now about what's called distant reading, an idea that came from Franco Moretti. Um, and it doesn't really caught on much in musicology, as far as I can see. And distant reading there means you don't actually read the stuff. You, as it were, get a computer to read it for you and uh, draw certain conclusions about it. And sometimes it's very trivial things, how often this word occurs near that word and so on. But that can tell you things about the literature. The same kind of thing can be done in music, is done to, to some extent, but there has to be a different way of thinking about the material that goes with it. And here I'm going to get on one of my hobby horses, which is basically we all need to know more statistics. Uh, we actually need to know of our philosophy pretty well too, um, because we need to understand the kind of basis of, of knowledge and uh, um, the basis of as it were, truth and the things, the claims that we make. But we need to know the statistics too, because that's how you deal with large quantities and know the reliability of conclusions drawn from large quantities of data that you haven't looked at closely, you've only looked at in a distant kind of fashion. So everybody needs to learn philosophy and statistics, in my view. First thing, David, yeah. for your thing about the students, music students too need to learn some statistics. Uh, but there are other things about methodology that probably have to be adjusted in musicology for the digital age. The second challenge is about is I think to music theory, and that music there's a challenge to readjusting music theory, not in the sense of making the theory different, and though in some cases we might look back and say actually this aspect of traditional music theory is simply wrong, and it needs to be adjusted uh, now that we can actually test it against data properly. Um, and there has been quite a lot of interesting work in this field. Um, 
the, the, what we were hearing about earlier, uh, implementations of uh, the generative theory of tonal music, for example, uh, has exposed the limitations and shortcomings of that theory, and so makes a very direct challenge to a specific music theory. Um, there's also, I know, studies that uh, David Huron does quite a lot of this, and Mark Gotham and has been working with Michael Scott Cuthbert on uh, investigating some aspects of music theory as well against large corpora. So this is a challenge to theory there, I think, because, again, a different way of doing things are our music theory tools really appropriate to the digital age too. You might need adjusting. The third challenge then actually is about engagement, something that uh, um, Kevin talked about nicely. Um, that I think digital tools and digital data give a way of allowing musicologists to engage with the public much more effectively than they have in the past. Um, let's be honest, the general public actually are not very interested in musicology. If you look at it from the point of view of how many famous musicologists are there. Yes. Are there any famous musicologists? Uh, and yet, the public is actually fascinated in music. Um, so the, an easy way to get lots of readers in, um, in a newspaper or uh, online music, online news, is to say something about music, something controversial <coughs> about this, uh, this musician was not so revolutionary after all, and this is the really great, and that's the kind of thing that gets lots of readers. And that's a kind of musicology. So, uh, here I think is the challenge, that the digital uh, tools and digital data allow us to engage, and the kind of things that Michael was talking about as well, to, to have people engage directly with the music, not just saying, oh, I really like this kind of music, or this, um, this style, that style, but the actual musical materials become available for uh, manipulation and investigation through digital tools, I think. And to me, this would be actually the most positive outcome of this mm. if it were to re-engage people's interest with actual musical materials, not just pieces of music. We know that people are interested in pieces of music, and music has become commodified much, much more than it ever was, and so that people can say, oh, I like this kind of music, but, the, but their engagement with the actual materials of the music has con uh, correspondingly declined because they can just get a whole piece of music. There's no need to have somebody play it on a piano or to have a score or any of those kinds of things. So digital uh, tools, I think, are a way of re-engaging people with the actual materials. There we go. Those are my three challenges for the future, methodology, uh, music theory, and engagement. Yes. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, are there any immediate responses to that or, or more considered ones later? But uh, I'd like anybody who responds to identify themselves first of all so that we know when we're um, writing this up from the recording who is speaking. So could you make sure you, make, you say your name before you uh, ask your question? Um, shall we have a, a new voice in the back? Hi, I'm Chris Donald. I'm a lecturer in computing at Goldsmiths. Did everyone hear that? Did the microphone hear that? Who knows? Um, and I'd like to, I would love everyone to know more statistics. <laughs> <laughs> and I would love my computing students, allegedly you were, to know more statistics. And I find this a challenge in practice. And computing, at least in this country, is still a gross subject with students wanting to come and study it and departments opening rather than closing. If you introduce more challenging, I agree, foundational material, do you potentially cut off the audience of the need? I don't have an answer in that yet, but but if you have, if you are running a music course and you say to your students, right, in the first year, one of your courses is on statistics, mm -hmm. do you suddenly have no students in your second year? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I think that's a, a very interesting point. Any response to that, Alan? 
First year university is too late, in my opinion. <laughs> so this question suddenly becomes political. <laughs> We're into a brave new world. Uh, I, I, I must admit that it has been noticeable how much more exposure in the last five years on, on the, the British media, uh, statistics in general, have uh, has received. Um, we used to moan, I remember, uh, uh, you know, oh God, none of these journalists understand statistics. I think they've tried very hard to engage, um, at least at a superficial level. Of course, anybody who knows anything about statistics knows how dangerous that is. But I would, my, my hope is that with guidance, pointing people in the right direction, um, gradually, people can acquire more uh, intuitive understanding, if you like, of the way numbers work, large numbers work. Um, Christoph is probably laughing at this, but, but I, we, we have seen, Christoph and I have seen the, the danger of um, a student uh, not understanding statistics and finding a website which purported to analyze something and produce a, uh, an account of its um, likelihood, or uh, I can't remember the actual terminology, but uh, the, the probability that it is correct, uh, and completely getting it wrong because they simply fed in the data without understanding what, what was actually required for this particular analysis. Um, that was a few years ago, and I would hope that while such what you might call rogue websites still exist, that if, as one hopes, um, you know, more sophistication in mathematics at, at, at school level filter through somehow into the, into the student community, that uh, people will be better advised, shall we say, in dealing with these things. Because it, it is completely unrealistic to expect a mu music students to do a course in statistics as, as you would do if you were doing physics or you were doing um, computer science even. A, a computer scientist try and get away without understanding it. Um, in physics you can't, uh, you, you have to engage with it. Um, but expecting music students to do a, a physics level uh, statistics uh, uh, course is completely unrealistic, but I think we, we can understand that. Uh, or may, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Can, well, sorry, can I just... Where's it going to fit? That's the other question, I mean, amongst all the other things. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm Matthew Paul House from McMaster University in Canada. Um, so uh, if I can just talk about the experience that we've, we've had from, from my, my institution. Um, we have a thing called the Music Cognition Specialization, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a bunch of courses, I think it's about eight to ten courses, which are taken, can be taken either from uh, psychology or from music. And uh, it's, a, it's a specialization which goes on the, the student's transcript, and it's sufficiently rigorous that a music student can actually use it as a basis for an MSc, uh, and obviously a psychology student with a psychology uh, BSc can you, uh, go on to the MSc. Um, and one of those courses within the specialization is on statistics. Mm -hmm. And I think what, and because it's a music cognition specialization, what happens in the statistics course in the specialization is that it is music focused. I'm not sure I, I share Alan's pessimism about the fact that it's too late if they don't have any statistics by the time that they, that they come to university. So long as the statistics is relevant to their subject, it will draw them in and make them realize that there is something to inferential statistics, which, which is a useful research tool, which is a vital research tool. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're going to uh, explore music from a psychological or scientific or a systematic perspective, so uh, it, the, one of the answers to this may be about interdisciplinarity. So looking for a way in which uh, music departments, which are traditional silos, can actually go outside and, 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 and think about a blended course or a blended program 
where the psychology departments, because it's the psychology departments that have the skills yes. uh, that can be used to develop an interest in a, a systematic approach to, to thinking about music. That's the experience that we have. And so in my lab in, in, in McMaster, most of my students uh, actually come from psychology. They don't come from music, but I do have a certain number of them that come from music that have gone through the specialization and have therefore have some of the basic skills that are required to do research. So that's the optimistic view um, uh, that it can, it can be achieved if you, if you blend and, and are prepared to, to, to reach out particularly to psychology. I think that's very positive. Yes, I think, uh, thank you very much for that contribution. Um, has anybody got anything to add on this particular point before we, uh, Mark? Hi, I'm Mark Watson of Cambridge. Proud shout out to Eve from Alan's brief talk. And also uh, from the other end of the emotional spectrum, uh, unsuccessful uh, proposer of a digital musicology course at the uh, university, which could be amazing. Uh, and I wonder whether a, um, for, for various reasons, some of which I, I, I completely understand, but uh, you speak to, I think, some of the issues at stake here. And I just, my question is what people think about the idea of uh, interactive online teaching resources as a way to solve the uh, potential issue of university being too late, university being too niche and expensive for many people. Um, and uh, this comes on the back of some conversations that a few of us have had about emerging uh, such resources that span um, statistics, coding online, the Python um, Code Academy is, is good fun. Uh, for instance, I think they can do that right. Um, computer science in some universities, music theory in some other contexts, complete with uh, interactive and, uh, elements where you can get uh, marked in real time. Um, am I naive to think of that as a, as a really effective? not by panacea, but a um, way to allow people who don't otherwise have access to this kind of thing at least some kind of way in. I think that's a very interesting point about uh, the, of the online courses. Of course, there's an enormous amount available now, and there's going to be an increasing um, uh, amount of good course material available uh, in the future, I mean, it's, it, it, that's clear enough. There seems to be a, quite an impetus there. Um, and it may well be that, that that might be one of the ways in which people could fill in gaps, perhaps in that time between, <laughs> between school and university, I don't know. Uh, uh, but you know, they need a lot of encouragement, I would think. Um, what do you think about this, Michael? Do you want to, well, that, you want that, uh, that leads on to something I, I, I was going to say anyway, uh, following on from what David and Kevin were saying uh, about this whole difficulty of, as it were, kick-starting it, of uh, the chicken and egg situation. And one of the difficulties, I think, particularly is that um, when we're just starting with this and we want to teach it at whatever level, um, we may not have in all departments the people who yeah. have the knowledge to do the teaching. How, how do you get started? And then also, how do you motivate people to get involved in something that may be strange and unfamiliar with them? Um, and how, therefore, do you get them to take these online courses or whatever it might be? And it's certainly a real challenge, not an easy problem to solve. Um, but I think one of the ways uh, that hopefully we can do it is that as more and more examples of good practice, of good outcomes from the use of digital musicology become available if uh, students, whether they're first year or third year students, if, if when, let's say first year, if a first year student studying some aspect of musicology has examples given to them in class which are not just examples from a textbook but are examples that are in some way using digital resources <coughs> and if they see this and they think oh yes this is uh, this is really exciting the, obviously the digital medium has really made something here that is meaningful to me that's exciting something I don't know then they're more likely to be motivated to want to go and use those resources for themselves, whether it's in a, a workshop or whether it's uh, by taking an optional course or whatever it is. And if they see that they perhaps need to make the most of that, to have training in programming or training in statistics or whatever, 
Um, they will perhaps be motivated, whether it's part of the curriculum or whether it's an online resource. So I think a key thing is um, to, to get examples out there and in the teaching of musicology in universities to have right through the curriculum uh, some striking examples where people think, oh yes, uh, it's obviously really, really important I do that. I can just say, just, uh, just put on record, I did statistics A-level, so I feel, I feel qualified now. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember anything about it, though. <laughs> Who, who are you? So, I'm Anna Kemp Miller, Southampton. Yes. Um, so I'm as a relatively recent student <laughs> in the scheme of things. Um, I kind of got into this field by accident. Um, actually, it was a module that got me interested in it. It's kind of a module in the same way as you were just talking, with really good examples. Um, Lee Fine Jackson, who you might know, um, used to do archaeology at Southampton, and he ran a digital humanities broad module. And all it was was just introduction to the projects that were going on at Southampton they use digital technologies, and it wowed me. And I took it because I couldn't get on the module I wanted to do at the time. That's literally how I fell into it. Um, and it inspired me to go into the field. And it's those sort of modules that sort of hit home with students. It's not teaching them the techniques necessarily, but it's teaching them what they could do in the end, what the output of it was. And again, we had kind of a similar situation to Cambridge. We had a failed module. We tried to do a digital musicology module a couple of years ago. Uh, couldn't get it through the board. They wouldn't let us do it. Um, so it's a similar sort of issue, but I wonder if we sort of have one of these sessions where we sort of show students what they could do with what these tools, what these tools could offer them, what they could enable. Maybe that would inspire more people. And sort of I find now that I get asked to present to undergrads quite a lot as having been an undergrad. And it's the same sort of thing. So people go, wait, you can do that kind of stuff, like with a music degree. Yeah. I think that that's, that's a really interesting observation about, about um, how um, what we call engagement um, can take place. Uh, uh, speaking about a specific um, uh, institution, you, you say you, you learn about the things that are going on locally, and that engages that interest. I think that's a very powerful, powerful thing. So I do it with year nine, year seven, year eight, year nine to school, outreach of what you could do with a music degree that isn't just using normal like, right. traditional music. So they yes. sort of try to incorporate it in the local area. So yes. it's more of those sort of programs, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Dave, say who you are. Uh, Dave Jura, Oxford. Um, just, just reflecting on the last few points you made, it seems like we have a couple of different kinds of uh, intervention here. One is bringing the digital through across the broader curriculum, and another is creating a, a bit of a custom module. And, and these are very, uh, this isn't very topical here, where we're just setting the curriculum for next year's Digital Humanities Summer School, we're also setting the curriculum for Digital Humanities pathway and master's program that's, that's due to start in, in a while. Um, and one way of thinking about this, I think, is to step a few years into the future. What, what does success look like? Where will we be in a few years' time? Will there be something called digital musicology? Will all digital methods just be things that are used in musicology in the sound of anyway? Uh, and then you can say, if that's the case, we still need an advanced digital musicology for <laughs> um, And, and that, that discussion is certainly occurring across digital humanities because the strong feeling certainly here is that at some point in the future, digital methods is just humanities. Yes. Uh, and it just happens to use some digital methods and, and, and some are digital. Um, but there's a point where it's useful to have something labeled as digital humanities, and we seem to be at that point. And then maybe it won't be the case with digital musicology. I don't think it's one module. I think it's something more pervasive across the curriculum. And these guys probably apply to statistics as well. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, I, I, can, I can see exactly, exactly what you're saying, and I've said as much myself in, in, in a different context. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't like labels like uh, computational or digital because it should be the tools we use. One aspect of all this that we haven't really talked about explicitly, but it's kind of come up implicitly a lot of the time, is the whole question of user interface. because. I can't help thinking that, that one of the key elements that you need for, to attract non-technical people is user interfaces that are sympathetic to them. Um, now, uh, it, it's a bit harsh to speak about Nick Collins' work um, when he's not here, but, but to have... Um, uh, it, uh, you know, command line um, um, 
what's it called, um, super collider interface, uh, it would be completely alienating for, for a typical music student. Um, and, uh, but there, there are other ways of doing such things. I'm not saying that particular uh, thing, but, but some of the more exploratory um, aspects of, um, of, of musicology, uh, you know, the search interfaces, things like that. I think uh, you know, once you have the possibility of using tools which are apparently already familiar, like search engines, um, then I think that that will help a lot. If you could, if you could literally do a Google search for a piece of music in in a in an interesting musical way, or all the kinds of music uh, corresponding to, to to some quite. Uh, I don't want to use words like query even because uh, it, it's stupid. But to some conceptual uh, 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 description, then then that would be a great help. But this is the point of the semantic approach that we've been um, uh, adopting um, to a large extent. And I see that Kevin wants to say something to shoot me down. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with Alan's point earlier that, that I mean I do think clearly some of the research technologies that we have would be very valuable if they were exposed in easier to use interfaces. But actually, I think part of that is just making them exposed in any interface, uh, not necessarily making them what? easier. Because I think there's a balance. I think you're absolutely right to get people interested. Yeah. It would be brilliant to have a really compelling interface. But once they're interested, yes. what they'll want is the nuts and bolts. Oh, oh. So it's a very fleeting moment, and that's therefore hard, I think, from a research but, perspective to justify. But that's the moment of engagement. That, that, that's, sure. that's but, the, but, uh, no, maybe it's the results then. Maybe it's the yeah. presentation of the results in a friendly way yeah. rather than the presentation well, of, of all too. of the steps of the method. in Because I wouldn't be cautious about oversimplifying it. You know? okay. Of course, Google we all know the dangers. Google probably doesn't do what you think. No, no, no. Google. Yeah. I use Google as a as a portmanteau uh, for for, mm. for, for so something quite different. Everyone does, actually. I think yeah. that's a similar danger to the dangerous statistics. It's probably not doing quite what you think. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Could I just? Uh, uh, there's something I thought of when, when um, Alan was talking earlier, because again, very much the same. I, I agree. I mean, part of our new project, Iramas, will be, as we've said, to. Uh, make tools that can be used, we hope, and attract in people who are not uh, technically uh, you know, specialists, experienced in, in using technology. Uh, but uh, having said that, um, I mean, the way I got involved in programming uh, as a composer initially was because I was using tools that had been simplified to make them easier to use, and because they were simplified, they were restricting, yeah. and I couldn't do the things I wanted. So as a composer, I thought, I want to do this, I want to do it won't do it, so I'll have to reprogram it myself. So yeah. in fact, the simplification actually led to me getting into a much uh, more complex and deeper level. And uh, so I think the same thing can apply, which is I think the point you were both making, that oversimplification can lead to inflexibility, to lack of options, to not really being able to control things. So it is this delicate balance, and perhaps we need tools that can be used at different levels, that can have an introductory level, that is not too frightening to get into, but then as people find they need more, then yeah. they have an open toolbox which allows them to, to work uh, yes. in a much more detailed way. Yes. All, all those things are technically possible, of course. Um, did, did, I don't know who got their hand up first. Did you, did you put your hand up? No, no, sorry. You just, you <laughs> I feel like an auctioneer <laughs> selling, <laughs> selling something rather expensive. <laughs> Uh, yes, so uh, I just wanted to amplify that by kind of saying, well, if, if we take it on, we have to make nice interfaces so that people use them, then we've already had success because people in music box are using Diane, they're using JSTOR, they're using, you know, the, the thing that, that gives you access to cool information is already out there and it's already being used. And I think it's the development of new research directions and research tools that is always going to need a certain amount of specialist skill because even if you're not programming it yourself you have to be able to conceive it, you have to be able to work out what it would mean and help specify it. I think there's a continuum, it's not either shiny or, a, or, or, or working at the command line but um, I do think you know, we can short sell it actually. There's a lot of good stuff out there already that people are using. Sure. Um, but that's 
what, you know, I don't want to say what is and isn't digital musicology, but using a computer is already there. Yes? Uh, so, a couple of questions. First of all, I was very interested in uh, Mike, Michael and your, your talk about uh, tile, because uh, it's, it's visually very appealing and mm -hmm. very intuitive to use. You, hear, you can see the spectral uh, sort of flow of music, and I'm going to isolate this and I can listen to this. Uh, is it able, are, are users able to upload their own audio to that? Yes, definitely, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's the whole idea. Uh, as I say, that was. Not uh, we did that as part of this TACM project. Right. It wasn't actually part of what we'd planned to do. But uh, Frederick and I were talking about our plans at the very beginning of the project. He said well, it would be useful to develop some tools. So, uh, but because it wasn't part of the project, we I mean it's developed quite a long way as you can see. But it's it's not gone as far as we want. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we hope in the new project. And if you're saying Frederick, we we'd hope to um, uh, to develop it further along with other similar tools. Mm. That's fantastic. My, my second question is actually to. to Kevin, uh, and we've been talking about access to information, and uh, one of the most important uh, workshops and conferences is the Digital Libraries for Humanities, uh, sorry, for Musicology uh, uh, workshops, which are now an annual event. Um, we, we, we submitted a paper and we, we had it accepted, uh, and it's actually a long paper. Um, it was in Shanghai this, this summer. Um, one of my gripes is that access to this paper uh, is behind a $15 firewall. And uh, whereas if we published it in Izmir, uh, I could just access it for nothing. And, and this is a sort of slight frustration is that you know, researchers go through a lot of work to produce a, a, something that they hope is going to have uh, easy access. Um, so if there, is a, if there is a way of making, of pulling this away from ACM, digital libraries, which charge, uh, it would be much appreciated. And I think it would, it would help the citations of papers at, at the conference. So if there's any way of doing that, I really would. I think that's a really good point and one to take in mind. We, when we made that choice originally, it was to a certain degree to get the sort of stamp of ACM, right. which mattered a lot, I think, certainly during the first couple of of issues, um, and there is a, a, a very good question there as to whether we're now strong enough to not need that. I, the way we're sort of I think, given how rigorous the review process is for digital libraries for musicology, I would say you don't need them because I think it, it, it has a rigorous um, <coughs> review process, which is, which I think is blind, and and I think that probably um, ensures uh, a, a certain quality. Which, which, which enables you to break through. I mean, there's a general question there as well, is that as, as it does visit the kind of not necessarily by intent, I think originally, the very first time I remember asking the question, should we do this every year? Should we do it every other year? I mean, it wasn't, there wasn't clear consensus, actually, in the room um, about what it becomes. And if anyone wants to talk to me about that in the part, I'm, I'm all ears. Because, you know, it, actually, the 60 pages is no longer a workshop. Really? Yeah. It's anything that's come. And, and whether that's and that, but there have also been questions around whether we should be making it sort of a musicology part of Disney and what it becomes, because its remit is somewhat expanded. And I think that's, those are all very good questions, which I think are wrapped up in then how the proceedings come out, because that's part of basically how self sustaining that community becomes. Can you supplement my answer in case you're interested, uh, or anybody else? Uh, I think I'm writing saying that Tiles is still available. Yes, yes we put, although it's not, we don't consider it complete and finished, uh, as it stands, it is available to download from the URLs that I gave there, so if you are interested in exploring it, but just on the understanding that we don't consider it uh, entirely finished yet, and, but we intend to do more work on it. Thanks. Does anybody else want to ask a question, well, to point the discussion in a different direction or raise something that hasn't come up yet or talk about some elephant in the room that we've all been forgetting? <laughs> like, um, well, open access has just re reared its ugly head. Um, it's pretty uh, head. <laughs> 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 yes, <Yeah>, sorry. <laughs> um, 
Because, it, uh, yes, please. Well, just a general, well, Luca Guariento, I'm based in Glasgow, digital humanities research officer over there. Um, I just, uh, I don't know, but just a very general question. We're talking about musicology per se, just uh, in general, or are we talking about replacing musicology with digital musicology? Or are we talking about a branch of musicology? We're talking about new musicology, a post modern post post, post I think that's just, uh, well, for well, me, we that's just what we don't want. But, but I, might, I, I might be wrong. Uh, it, 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 I've always wanted to provide tools and mechanisms to assist musicologists doing what, do what they do. Uh, and this was something that uh, Lawrence Dreyfus um, uh, persuaded me uh, 20 years ago uh, that, that, that um, it would be futile to try and set up something in opposition to normal musicology, which was digital and therefore different. I mean, that, that's... And, and we've, we've already had a new musicology, which was a different thing. Uh, actually, to be honest, uh, we have, that's something we haven't really talked about, but um, uh, it, there are potentials for uh, getting out of the approach that we're doing, which is very much concerned with the music itself, to uh, approach the new musicology attitude, the postmodern view that uh, it's not so much the, 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 the content of, as, it, as it is about the context of, of music and the context of the modern observer of that music, uh, the modern um, uh, uh, um, consumer or whatever it is, the critic. Um, and, and there are potentials which we haven't really talked about at all for, for integrating these things so that I, I still think there's still going to be this deep study of music and I don't care what what label it gets. That's what I consider musicology. And I don't, I, don't, I don't really care whether it's new musicology, whether it's digital musicology, computational musicology, um, abacus musicology, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's, it's studying music, whatever that is. And the, the, you know, that's a, another issue we haven't really talked about, what music is. Um, and, and the mention, the me the, exactly, the, the mention of psychology, uh, of course, that's, that's, that is the elephant in the corner in the way, that, that, that we, we've hardly touched on that. That would take another three such workshops to discuss fully. Uh, and, and unless anybody, oh, Kevin's got something burning to say. Well, I was going to say, I think the question of reaching the panel anyway, but do you believe in the internet, and this comes back to today's question, that something like that needs to exist as a means to an end? Well, well, if if it gets gets uh, um, universities to think of it as something they want to invest in, if if it's a brand, as it were, well, the, digital mechanism for, for teaching potentially. I, mean, this, this, I think is what we've been discussing. It may be that that's not a desirable end, but how do you get there? Well, my concern is about labels. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't really like the labels. Um, I, I, you know, it, but but as means to an end, yes. Uh, no, no, I don't have I don't have problems with with the approach um, at all. But uh, uh, I think Alan, you had something to say. Well, I was just going to say uh, now that new musicology is being mentioned. Um, <laughs> 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 The, 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 there's a, a lazy assumption that new musicology should be somehow in opposition to uh, digital methods mm -hmm. um, because uh, of the, I suppose because of the roots of new musicology is a reaction to so-called positivism and music mm -hmm. analysis so on, which, which appears to be more technical numbers kind of quantifying thing. Um, because, in fact, if new musicology is about seeing music in, in terms of, of, of a much broader context and um, uh, getting away from the canon and all those kinds of things, then actually digital yeah. methods help Absolutely. in this. For one thing, and it's enormously opened up the domain of music that is available for inquiry. So now there's musicology that deals with DJ sets, for example, with all sorts of popular music recordings because 
because the materials had become amenable to scholarly study in a way that it was difficult um, without some kind of, even simply because of recordings, but access to recordings as well. And crucially, access to some of that contextual data about who's listening to this music and mm. what do they say about it, because it's all there mm. in the streaming services that, yeah. which people use for um, listening to music by and large these days. And that becomes accessible as, as digital materials for research using these kinds of digital methods. It's a shame in that sense that we don't have uh, our musicology of the social media. Yeah, well, yes, we haven't, <coughs> haven't really to represented that today at all. Uh, uh, but there was a strand to this project that was looking at what potential musicological uh, inquiries could be made yeah. by uh, trawling from social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I very much agree. I think which the our project was. Uh, trying to bring things together and not trying to put it in one corner, but mm -hmm. trying to bridge all these different areas. Just got a few more minutes. Carolyn, would you like to speak? Yes, uh, Carolyn Lindfleisch. Um, I wanted to say that uh, I think also one thing that we sometimes forget is that a confrontation with new methods does not necessarily lead to a replacement of the old methods, but if you do it in a kind of conscious way, it can also lead to a strengthening of the existing methods because it uh, leads to uh, researchers stepping out of the comfort zone and examining the existing material, uh, the, uh, methods under a new um, perspective mm -hmm. and um, doing them more consciously, doing them, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, um, more sharply outlined, it, it leads to a more sharp, sharp, a sharper outline. The, the existing methods as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Rigo. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I, I just noticed that uh, it's it's about 25 past, so if there's time really for one more question. To David, did you want? Did you? It was just when we were having the shout out to the social networks um, section of this project, Ben Fields were here. I, it just occurred to me that when you were talking earlier about the general public's willingness to engage with music, um, but not necessarily with all that sort of stuff beyond you know, listening to it and maybe sharing it. But one of the things that the um, that, that Ben Fields' work was looking at on in, in trust in musicology was this website called originally rapgenius.com and then genius.com, um, where large numbers of people annotate the lyrics of actually now quite a lot of genres of music, um, in painstaking detail with references to Wikipedia um, to explain small slang variations in New York rap or whatever. And I think that one of the reasons that that is there is because it's text. And so the, the technology is there supporting that degree <coughs> of fine-tuned observation. And if we could create the sort of interfaces to allow that sort of engagement with sound, Mm. because this is how most of them are, most mm. people encounter music. I do think we might well have more engagement. I mean, that's one of the things I think that Michael's project is so exciting for. Or even yeah. if we had a kind of uh, an interactive Tido thing, like yeah. what Roy was talking yeah. about. Yeah. You yeah. Know, if, if, if everybody could make the kind of observations that you were making about Chopin and Debussy and so on, say, hey, look, this chord, it's the mm. same as that chord, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. <coughs> Great. Well, thank you everybody for coming. It's been a most interesting day, and uh, I hope you've, well, for me it's been a most interesting day. Um, but then... It right. has been the most interesting yes. day. Well, okay, three people think it's been a most interesting day. <laughs> I'm delighted that, as far as I'm concerned, that's the result. <laughs>